The Man Who Awoke by Lawrence Manning Book 2 Master of the Brain Chapter 1. 8,000 Years It was really a charming scene. Some huge hickories overshadowed it to the north, and a great sequoia towered on the west, secluding the natural clearing to the warm southeast winds. Over its floors ran vines whose bright green leaves and clumps of partridge berries showed red in the midsummer sun. All around, the wilderness. At the foot of a bank of mountain laurel was a slight depression in the carpet of brown leaves, as if water settled there in heavy rains. No human habitation, nor any vestige of the human touch, was observable through the undergrowth in any direction. This was strange, for the spot was once on the map as a fashionable suburb of New York City. To a twentieth-century observer, another thing would have been noticeable. The woods were of natural growth, but the sequoia is a native of the California coast. To the squirrels who frequented the trees, the sequoia was no stranger. It had stood there through thousands of squirrel generations, and was now as natural as the hickories. One red squirrel, nosing for last year's nuts near the tangle of laurel, stopped all motion suddenly and eyed the depression in the ground rather sharply. Something strange going on. Away, like a streak of fire, he darted halfway up a tall sapling and hung upside down, swearing like his betters. Nothing happened. Then he ran down again and over to the depression. He cocked a listening ear a full sixty seconds. Suddenly he leapt away and made for his tree. As he did so, the solid earth showed raw beneath the covering of dead leaves, and a hole appeared, into which the sunlight poured. A shock of grey hair showed below the ground. It rose slowly, as a plant might push its stem up through the earth in spring, coming through with earth and leaves sticking to it and smelling of a long hibernation below the ground. But this was not a plant. The hair belonged to a head, and the head to the body of an old man. And this was so contrary to proper reason and conduct that the red squirrel stopped his chatter of protest and made off for more safe and sane portions of the forest. In deathly stillness the man brushed leaves and dirt from his person with a painfully slow and feeble motion and stood looking about him in bewilderment. A scraggly crop of whiskers covered the lower part of his face, but the mouth showed firm and sensitive, and the thin, aristocratic nose loomed sentinel-like over the tangle. His hands were thin and terribly emaciated. Long nails, soiled with recent earth, grew unevenly from the delicate and tapered fingers. He was dressed in a leather jacket and heavy, silk-like breeches of dark green, ending in leather leggings. In spite of the earth stains, the man was immaculately dressed, incongruously so, for his face was lined and wrinkled and his body was wasted and thin. With faltering steps, he made his way to a grey, moss-covered boulder and sat down, still staring about him, as if he were amazed by everything he saw. The thin white lips moved slightly, and a barely audible whisper escaped gone, all gone, eight thousand years, and nothing but wilderness. His thoughts went back to the pain and agony of his awakening three days ago, down there beneath the ground. He could not remember it all, but fragments of visions came and went. That first reaching for the reviving medicine when the violet rays had waked him, to move his hand ten inches, what an incredible journey that had been. Inch after inch, hour after hour, his fingers had crawled, dragging the powerless arm after them, 
and how had he ever succeeded in getting the bottle to his mouth? He couldn't remember that. His eyes had seen a red mist, and his body trembled in every part with an agonised determination of will-driven effort that passed beyond reasoning. When he came weakly to his senses, he felt the miracle was complete. A slight turn of the stopper had permitted a stream of liquid to enter his open mouth and burn there, for he couldn't swallow. But enough had trickled down his throat, even if still more had wet his couch. That medicine, his friend the biologist, had prepared it five thousand years ago, in the village among the trees, for this very need of his. All dead and gone now, and their very village forgotten. For about him was no longer the regularly spaced grove of those men of the trees, whose botanical genius had found an easier way to grow food than by cropping the soil. That medicine had sent him into a drugged sleep from which he awoke in the few hours strong enough to reach for another drink. Three days he had rested, recovering his strength and subduing his impatience to see what changes the years had brought up above. Then he donned fresh clothes from the vacuum chamber, which had preserved them from the fate that had befallen the tattered rags he awoke in, leaving the lead-lined chamber fifty feet below to feast his twentieth-century eyes upon a world surely transformed by five millennia. With what eagerness he'd made his way up the stone-walled tunnel, scraping and pushing at the drifted earth. And now, here he was. His time journey was over, for unless he could rebuild his chamber, he must live out such days as remained to him right where he was. The eight thousand years since the chamber had been built had done too much damage. He shuddered anew at the thought of that lead pipe covered with deep white powdered cracks. What a miracle it hadn't given way before its purpose was fulfilled. A mere matter of a hundred years one way or the other. Suddenly his bent body seemed to straighten, and his head was held higher. Come, he said, aloud to the silent woods. This patch of shrubbery is not the whole world. Be off with you, Norman Winters, and see what is to be seen. The voice was deep-pitched but thin in tone, and sounded as if the man were testing his vocal organs, rather than addressing anyone. But the words awakened anew all the little forest voices. The squirrels commenced scolding vociferously, as if protesting against this apparition from beneath the ground, turning out to be only another animal. Winters cocked an ear to the friendly sounds, and smiled as he pushed his way through the shrubbery toward the east. He was looking for something, and presently he came upon it, a great highway of green glass stretching north and south as far as the eye could see. This much was exactly as he'd found it on his first emergence from the chamber five thousand years ago. But no, not exactly the same. After all, there was a dreary, unused appearance about it, Along the margins lay drifted refuse of the centuries, fallen branches, streaks of sand, litter of leaves, and close to the vitreous edge, shrubs grew and occasionally large trees. He stamped his feet on the five-thousand-year-old surface and marvelled at its durability. Feeling lost in the emptiness of the world, he set off northward, and after an hour's slow walking came to a great crack in the highway, beyond which a section of hundreds of yards long was uptorn and splintered as if by an earthquake. Or could it have been a bomb? He was near the village he'd visited so many years ago, so he looked about hopefully for signs of human beings, but in vain. Not the slightest trace of the village remained. Neither stick nor stone gave indication of ancient human occupation. He saw only the wilderness on each side of the hard pavement. The fresh air and the exercise had set his sluggish blood to circulating briskly, and some colour had appeared in his pale cheeks. He sat down to rest his aching muscles and to chew a pellet of condensed food from his pocket. What should he do now? He had enough food for a few days and some simple tools in his belt. Should he settle down at this point and build himself a hut and gather nuts and fruit from the forest and shoot game for meat? He shook his head determinedly. Somewhere in this new world there were people. He must find them. Very sadly and soberly, he continued his walking, choosing to continue northward, and did not see the flying ship pass so silently overhead, to vanish over the treetops on the right. But the ship had seen him. It was small, and like a shiny metal cigar. It had been cruising low over the forest, and upon sighting the man below had banked sharply, and swung around behind him and to the right, so that its shadow would not apprise him of its approach. Silent as an owl, it floated fifty feet up, and like a bird of prey, it swooped down. 
To Winters, the shock was breathtaking. A great net of tough silk cord descended from the sky and settled upon him. Then he was swept off his feet and borne high into the air within the compass of a mere second. For a moment, he had an upside-down view of the world beneath as he hung, dangling and swaying. Then he felt himself drawn up swiftly and through a doorway in the floor of the ship which closed after him noisily. He lay on the floor of the cabin, near the tail, where twenty feet away stood an apparition dressed in the most glowing shades of gold and scarlet. Its smooth satin trousers were scarlet, and its shapely legs were encased in gold. Gold, too, was the flowing shirt beneath the scarlet jacket, and on its head was a helmet of golden metal. The face was youthful and of great beauty, but whether man or woman, Winters could not decide. The body, likewise, was soft and full, yet in a nameless way sexless to Winter's twentieth-century eyes. He was too stunned to make any attempt to escape from the capturing net. After watching him a moment with hard, eager eyes, his captor pulled a cord, and Winters felt the net loosen. In a few moments he stood, shakily, on his feet, and made a tentative step forward. His outstretched hand touched free air, so his eyes told him, yet it felt hard and unyielding as glass. With a startled exclamation he tried again, and an amused smile parted the lips of the figure at the forward end of the cabin. "'Have you never seen the barrier ray before, Wilding?' The English words were almost unrecognisable in that soft, blurred accent, though the voice was low and sweet. Winter's first thought, "'So she's a woman, then?' Not for a second or two did the familiar syllables connect themselves in his mind with his own language. Then, with a start of surprise, he said, "'What do you want with me? Where are you taking me?' She smiled again. "'What do we always want of you, Wildings?' "'I don't know what you mean.' "'Nonsense. You must have heard that we've hunted you for five hundred years, and you must know what we're about. You were very easy, Wilding. Whatever persuaded you to walk in the middle of the great highway? Didn't you know you'd be caught?' Winters thought rapidly a moment. "'Wilding. That must mean he'd been taken for a man who lives in the woods here. Good enough. But why were such men hunted?' He smiled disarmingly. "'Why should I fear to be caught? I'm doing no wrong.' Wrong. You're not living in the city, doing your work and conforming to the laws of civilization, are you? You are not, she thought a moment in silence. By the way, where were you walking to? I wanted to find the nearest city, of course. Oh, she eyed his unkempt beard doubtfully, then turned hesitatingly to the control board of the ship and pushed a button. She smiled at Winters saucily. You did seem rather quiet. I've had Wildings almost wreck the cabin, but of course, if you were looking for a city, there's none better than where we're going. We don't usually have such an easy time making converts to civilization. I have released the barrier ray, and you may come forward with me now, if you wish, but do not touch anything. His brain bewildered with the hidden secrets of policy thus half revealed, Winters was soon comfortably seated looking down at the miles of forest, while the ship speeded due north. His new friend introduced herself as Valyar, and seemed to be a very pleasant person. She spent so little time guiding the ship, and paid such slight attention to its controls, that he questioned her about their course. "'We go to the brain,' she replied simply. "'He will guide us.' "'The brain?' Valyar stared a moment, then smiled. "'Surely you must know. Why, how quaint! Have you never heard of the brain?' "'No.' But for the past ten centuries it has ruled the world. Does news travel so slowly in the wilderness? I do not get much news. I live by myself, you see. Tell me about it. How quaint. No one will believe this when I tell it. The brain is... Well, it is a machine that includes every function of the human brain and surpasses it in most things. It is totally unprejudiced, absolutely infallible. The government of our civilization has been given over to it. Only by its guidance have we been able to reduce the working hours of mankind to one hour a week. Think of that, Wilding. You are free to live in our city and enjoy all its comforts and such luxuries and pleasures as you have ever imagined, all at the price of one hour's easy labor each week. I know you will say there are other cities, but ours is the actual residence of the brain. Other cities throughout the world are mere stations controlled by it. Surely you would prefer to live in the centre of the civilised world? 
some familiar touch reminded Winters of the old-fashioned sales talk of his own times. What its purpose could be he did not know, could not imagine. But one thing was certain. He had been hunted and captured, and was now being persuaded to live in some city. He decided to say absolutely nothing about his own affairs until he could learn more. Where is your city? he asked. Half an hour to the north, beside the Great Falls. But this brain, do you obey it whether you like it or not? He noticed a sudden furtive glance towards the ceiling where a small black box protruded. His companion's voice had a slight tremor in it as she answered, Certainly the great brain is infallible. Who would want to act contrary to reason? Winters persisted in his questions and found her strangely averse to discussing this phase of their life. He turned his attention to the landscape spread out below. Presently he made out a white mark far ahead set against the green ground. As they drew closer, this proved to be a great wall hundreds of feet in height. It evidently surrounded the city of their destination, for the familiar outlines of Niagara lay beside it. Over the city a dome of clear glass stretched like a bubble, and Winters could make out buildings and streets inside. The airship settled lower and lower, and presently landed gently close to the city wall at a point where a huge archway broke its smooth contour. Valia left him a moment, and returned with a tall man dressed in green and scarlet silk. This is Supervisor Contrig, she said. He will show you our city and, no doubt, invite you to join us here, if you wish. With a flashing smile, she turned to attend to her ship, whereupon Winters set off on foot with his new guide, a lean and sallow fellow whom he somehow disliked at first sight. They walked up to the great gate in the hot sunshine, where two scarlet and gold men stared at him curiously as they pulled the opening lever. A door opened and they entered the city. "'Why, it's cool!' exclaimed Winters. "'Of course, Wilding, did you think we would be content with whatever nature pleased to give us in the way of weather?' They walked down a street towards the centre of the city, flanked on both sides by factory buildings and workshops. The streets were made of green glass, and the buildings of white composition, the same as the city wall. But inside the buildings, plainly visible through great glass windows, there spread to his view a scene like the dreams of a mad architect like the inside of a museum of machinery, all in automatic operation. Strange inventions and refinements of ancient mechanisms sprang up in window after window. Here was material to delight his historian soul, the very kind of future civilization that dreamers and prophets had imagined back in the twentieth century. A thrilling vista of wonders and a consummation of the mechanical evolution. The street ended in a cross avenue, which curved beyond the site and evidently encircled the city. Not many men were visible even here, and those Winters saw were hurrying along about their affairs. Moving platforms at three different speeds ran in both directions, and a stationary sidewalk flanked them. On each side rose the buildings, great blocks of masonry which ended in graceful towers of shimmering glass and metal close under the roof. The sunlight streamed through and glittered on the towers. Winters saw an airship pass overhead above the glass. Winters asked where the workers were. In their workrooms, of course, said Contrig. I will show you. He led the way into one of the buildings and guided Winters through a corridor. The walls were of glass and, looking through, he observed the labours of these folk of the hundredth century. Each person sat on soft cushions or lay on couches in private cubicles. Some slept. Some leaned over the partition, talking or playing some kind of game on a board with their neighbours. The dresses were luxurious and of soft tones, setting off the remarkable beauty of their wearers, but as a picture of men at work it conformed with none of Winter's preconceived ideas. These people are at work, said Contrig, and, as Winter's raised eyebrows, continued, while on duty each must devote perhaps an hour a day to his task. During that time he may not leave the workroom. He used a word, labre, which Winter's had to have explained, after a week at work come five weeks of rest and recreation, usually at the pleasure palaces, which I shall show you later. But what work do they do? See that young woman there? She stopped her relaxation and is getting up to tend to the distribution board. She is apportioning averages for the reserve stores, and that elderly man is collating orders for the karma vats and routing them through the automatic machines. 
Most of the work, of course, is very light and agreeable in nature. There is some heavy work, machine designing and so forth, under the guidance of the brain, which is done only by the highest ranks. I, as a supervisor, am privileged to do such work. And he smiled, as Winters thought, in a precious, smug fashion. The pleasure palaces proved to be a combination of resort hotel and Muslim paradise, devoted in equal proportion to drinking and making love. All very well once in a while, Winters thought, but day after day for five weeks? He scarcely noted the things they passed until they came to a great reception room thronged with people. Here they stood a minute looking about them. Winters had an idea. But the more serious-minded men, scientists, planners, where are they? The supervisor stared haughtily. This is the city of the brain, he said. How should mere men hope to better his work? He is infallible. We are full of human weakness and frailties. I should not like to live here, said Winters decidedly. That is as you please. We should be glad to have you, but that is the way out. Over there. You can't miss it. And he turned on his heel. Chapter 2. The Pleasure Palaces the direction seemed exactly wrong to Winters. He started down the passage indicated, however, and had not gone fifty feet when a small arched door set in from the wall opened a crack and a white finger crooked itself at him. Hesitantly he paused and stared at the dark crack, but could see nothing except that beckoning hand. He stepped to the door, and it opened before him to reveal a man in flaming crimson silk. He placed his fingers to his ears and made a quieting sound with his lips, a curious gesture which Winters understood to mean secrecy. You're the wilding who came in today? Good. I see you do not like our life here. That enables me to trust you. There are others who do not like it. If I save your life, will you help us change ours? He peered eagerly at Winters, his thin hawk-like nose and high cheekbones giving him a particularly shrewd look. Winters was nonplussed. I don't know what you mean. If you should save my life, I would, I suppose, be grateful, and return the favour if I could. Good, then I'll save it for you. Turn yourself around, and hurry back to the supervisor, and tell him you've changed your mind, that you want at least one vacation at the Pleasure Palace. Hurry! But I haven't changed it. Fool! I save your life and risk mine by telling you. Do you suppose the end of this passage leads back to your wilderness? Do you suppose the brain ever lets a man escape once its fingers clutch him? Death awaits at the end of your passage, Wilding. Hurry back, man, hurry! Suddenly Winters found himself pushed out and the door closed softly behind him. In the crimson man's face he had seen truth and force. Winters hastened to retrace his steps. In a panic he found his way to the big hall, but Contrick had disappeared. He hurried over to the passage along which they'd come together and was relieved to see him at the other end of it. He caught up with him in a few minutes and plucked at his sleeve, panting. The supervisor was a trifle suspicious of such a sudden conversion, and Winters sweated out his simulated desire for the flesh pots until he succeeded in disgusting even himself. But he succeeded in soothing Contrig's scruples and brought a smile of unclean amusement to the man's face. So it happened that within the hour Winters found himself seated in a cubicle of his own, with a capable, if flirtatious young woman leaning over his shoulder and showing him how to route food from automatic factories to distributing centres. As a task it was puerile, and in ten minutes was wearily obvious. But his instructress remained some little time after that. Winters revised his estimate as to the sex quanta of these people of the future. Outward appearance, he decided, was no sure guide in such matters. For two hours he sat watching the control board and spent three minutes of that time correcting an error in routing. The rest of the time he did nothing. Presently a gong struck, and he observed through the glass partitions that his neighbours pushed various buttons set in a silver panel on the wall. He knocked on the glass, and the man in the next cubicle came over and lowered it out of the way. What is everyone doing? Food, Wilding. You order what you want to eat. Shall I order for you this first time? and amusedly he leaned over the partition and pushed three buttons. In five minutes the panel swung aside, and there stood a set of sliding shelves with drink and food. Winters had three dishes to choose from, and found one highly spiced, and the other two insipid. He was hungry, however, and ate nearly everything, and found the drink delicious, though heady. He was sleepy, and noticed his neighbour attach a gold bracelet and anklet to himself, 
and fall luxuriously back on his couch. He asked whether it was the sleep period, and was informed that a worker could sleep any time he wanted to, but he must put on the brain's controls if he did so. Then he observed that a fine wire led from the gold bracelet to a plug in the main control panel of the cubicle. When the panel calls for attention, an electric shock wakes you up. Probably you'll have nothing to do now until tomorrow morning, but while you're on duty, you must be always available. Winters thanked him and put on the gold bands, and was instantly in a deep slumber. It lasted a full twenty hours, for it was already morning when a sharp pain woke him. He looked around for a dazed moment, and noticed a red light over his panel. Then his whole being was aroused by the indignity of the electric shock which brought him to his feet in a hurry. He removed the anklet and wristlet, and resumed his duties. There was fifteen minutes routine work, and just as he finished it the gong struck. He went over to the food panel, and pushed every button on it. He was so ravenous. No man could have consumed all that food, but he left what he did not eat to be removed with the other dishes on the sliding shelf. He was enormously bored with the life he led. There was nothing he could see outside of his cubicle, except his neighbours on right and left. He discovered, however, one panel on the wall above the glass, which he had not seen before, and he asked his right-hand neighbour what its purpose might be. Uh, that is your news and amusement control. What does it do? Press the lower button and see. He did so, and instantly a six-foot space on one side became suffused with light, and voices spoke. After a startled second, he perceived that a play was going on somewhere, and was being relayed on the screen and loudspeaker. He sat down to watch it, when he heard his neighbour rap on the glass partition, which he lowered by moving a lever. Better put on your controls, the man warned, and nodded at the panel board. Winters donned the anklet and bracelet once more, and didn't take them off again while he remained on duty. The play proved uninteresting after the first ten minutes. It was all about the problems of a woman with seven lovers, so he pressed another button and saw on the screen a great sweep of country as if seen from an airship. This was more to his taste, and he watched, absorbing the broad stretches of forest and catching his breath when the white walls of a great city came to view. Then on, over a sheet of open water, and cruising above charming islands set in sapphire seas, it was travel made easy. Thereafter he spent most of his time watching the screen, while a voice explained the sights and named the towns that were passed. For a week he ate and slept, did his business at the controls, and enjoyed the travelogue. It was a restful and quiet way of life, and he gained strength daily. Winters learned a great deal about this civilization during his week in the work cubicle. The brain was housed in an imposing structure in the centre of the city. It had grown from small beginnings, and was still growing, now occupying almost half a cubic mile, with its millions of banks of selenium cells, thought records, contact switches, idea association relays, and a dozen other parts, the principles of which were beyond his understanding. From this brain was controlled, very literally controlled, the whole planet. Every city in the world had a relay station, through which this central brain dictated its policies and determined its destiny. In the cities, millions of observing and sound-detecting fixtures were hidden in walls and ceilings. No detail of action escaped the brain. No sooner did a problem or crisis arise than its solution was presented by the all-seeing Lord of Life. Even the planes, Winston learned, carried an observation box, and in the event of an attempt by the pilot to leave his ship, or in any way disobey his orders, an enormous charge of explosives was detonated, destroying ship and ill-doer alike. On the other hand, no action of virtue escaped notice and reward. Such men were promoted to the highest ranks, and they enjoyed great privilege and powers. The first rank was that of supervisor. These people had entire control of the workers' hours and the allotment of duties. Above them were the pilots of airships and men of action, explorers, missionaries, for the few remaining people in the wilderness were constantly being coaxed into the cities, and artists, including musicians, painters, playwrights and actors. Still higher were the mechanics and scientists, and at the head of all were the educators, who supposedly controlled the teaching and training of the young, and the preparation of data with which the brain itself was supplied. But this function had long been debased into a mere formal acceptance of the suggestions put forward as thinly veiled commands by the brain. Each class wore characteristic colours. The supervisors wore red and green, 
the men of action dressed in gold and scarlet, the artists pure blue, the scientists sheer white, and the educators gleaming black. As for the workers, the material of their clothes was not of such a high luster, and the colours were more varied, but kept below a certain undefined standard of brilliance, mainly in pastel shades. Winters once asked his right-hand neighbour, with whom he'd become rather friendly, "'What rank is dressed in bright crimson?' With a start of surprise, the man looked at him, and then furtively glanced at the corner of his cubicle. With downcast eyes, he replied, "'That is the colour of the brain. Only his personal mechanics dress in crimson. We have nothing to do with them. I'm surprised you've even seen one, for they seldom walk in public.' And he refused to talk about the matter further, though Winters was full of curiosity and questions. Winters eyed the corner of his cubicle speculatively, supposing that a detecting device must be concealed there. But if so, it was subtly concealed, for the ceiling and walls met in a perfectly smooth joint. He did a great deal of thinking about the state of this civilization. It was curiously like twentieth-century ideas of heaven. Here was a sort of infallible deity, all-knowing, omnipresent, a personal god, in fact. He punished and rewarded without error. The labour was so slight as to amount to perpetual leisure. The workers could scarcely wish for more luxury or comfort. Yet Winters felt an uncomfortable sort of resentment about it all, and he could readily understand an attempted revolt, such as the Crimson Man had hinted at on the day of his arrival in the city. The human race did not really need a god to show them how to live, Winters thought. What was needed was an unsolved problem on which mankind could exercise its ingenuity and inventiveness. Only by work could it evolve to a higher plane of existence. He, the observer of the centuries as they passed, saw this truth so plainly that he wondered at the stupidity of the human race in permitting itself to be fed and housed like cattle. He had begun to feel some warmth on this subject and began to wish that he might see the Crimson Man once more when his work period ended. Supervisor Contrig gave him his release orders. "'You will go first to the clothes studio and be dressed properly. Then find the South Pleasure Palace and ask for your accommodation. It's booked under your own name, Winters.' You've done your work well enough, so you now merit the fruits of your labour. I hope you enjoy yourself. His accommodation turned out to be one room and a bath. The walls were in light mauve, deeper at the floor and paling out towards a violet-tinted ceiling. No pictures adorned the walls, but there were two control panels which he recognised as food and amusement inlets. His new clothes seemed comfortable and soft, and, since the entire city's temperature was controlled, their thinness was not at the sacrifice of warmth. He learned how to turn on the tub by himself and soaked a steamy hour before retiring to a built-in couch with amazingly deep springs. Here he slept the clock around, had some unnameable sort of gruel for breakfast ordered by blindly pushing a button, and set out to explore the city, a new man inside and out. The arrangement of the buildings was this. In the centre rose the great Temple of the Brain, and around that the four pleasure palaces, named for the cardinal points of the compass. A broad avenue encircled this inmost group. Outside of this line were the work buildings, factories and so forth, all the way up to the outer wall of the city. Winter's first thought upon leaving the South Palace was to explore the working districts, but on crossing the avenue he was stopped by a supervisor in red and green. This is not the hour of the work shift. I was just seeing the city, uh, my first leisure period... That is not permitted. It would not do for those at work to see you at leisure. I may not go into the outer sections of the city? Of course not. You are at leisure. What manner of man are you that you forsake the pleasure palaces for the streets? Back went Winters. There were, then, only five buildings he could enter. He started at once for the entrance to the Brain Temple. But at its massive steel-grilled arch, a man in crimson stopped him, shocked at this casual attempt to enter sacred ground. No one, it appeared, under any circumstances might enter the temple, except the crimson-robed brain mechanics themselves. And so, by a process of elimination, Winters turned to the pleasure palaces. Since all four were seemingly identical, he chose his own building to begin with. The entrance hall contained banks of elevators, passages leading into the vast interior, and a control desk, behind which two attendants lay fast asleep on couches. The pressing of a button would have wakened both of them, nerves tingling from the shock from their slumbers, but Winters forbore doing so. 
Instead, he chose one of the passages by hazard and sauntered down it. He passed many closed doors before he came upon a wide archway and entered a hall in dark, glowing red, almost black. At one end, on a raised platform running from wall to wall, a line of flame flickered that was the only illumination in the room. Perhaps a hundred people danced upon the bare floor, two and two swaying on silent feet to the weirdest sounds Winters had ever heard. They formed some sort of music with a rhythm of constantly changing pulse and unstable tone, blending from harmony to harmony in indescribable fashion. The room was much warmer than any other place he'd visited, and this, or a combination of unknown psychic factors, seemed to bring the blood rushing to his temples where it throbbed in time to the devilish song of the flame. He backed out into the passage, bewildered, and as he did so a young woman in diaphanous silk approached him. She eyed him with sudden interest, and passed slowly, then stopped and turned back to smile at him. Winters fled. Presently he stopped, panting, for he was at the end of the passage, beyond which a great hall was brightly lighted, and men and women stood about, or sat on couches, amid a profusion of great shimmering plants, in gorgeous flower. He approached one of these to discover that the stem, leaves, and petal were all cleverly blown in coloured glass, and as he stood there someone tapped him softly on the shoulder. He turned quickly to recognise his neighbour in the work cubicles. Well, Wilding, you seem lost. Don't you like our fair city? I haven't seen much of it, and I'm afraid I don't understand much I've seen. It's really very simple. But you have no karma. May I get you some? What is karma? A thorough innocent, eh? That is our joy juice, our solace in trouble and the sharer of our joys. Our water of happiness. Wait here. He was gone a minute, returning with a glass of amber liquid, which he insisted that winters drain. There followed all the sensations of an old-fashioned cocktail. A warm glow spread from the pit of his stomach to the top of his head, and he felt ten years younger. And when you want another, just go over to any of the pillars in the room in the palace and press the pink button. Good stuff, isn't it? The beauty of it is that you've had a little too much, it counteracts itself, and you're instantly sober. If you don't want to be sober, that's embarrassing at times. We have to start in again and work back to the right stage. Eight drinks is my limit, though some can go ten and even twelve. The palace is divided into eight zones, you know, each of which is entered from a separate passage at the control hall. Each zone is for the use of those who've had the corresponding number of karmas. This is the one karma passage, and rather mild. You should see the eighth if you want a real sensation, or even the seventh. At this point, a group of young people broke in on them and dragged his friend off to some noisy party in one of the private rooms down the passage. Winters remained there reflecting on this amazing civilization into which he'd stumbled. Winters was no prude. He enjoyed a good time as well as another man. But he was a practical thinker and a scientist. This perpetual urge towards more and more leisure that might be wasted in the pursuit of mere physical joys seemed to him a tragic frailty for any race to possess. What would five thousand more years of this sort of thing produce, when the slight physical effort still required of the workers was taken care of by automatic machinery, and the last necessity for thought avoided by an enormously expanded machine brain? Was it for this that, back in the twentieth century, men dreamed and sweated and sacrificed themselves? It seemed somehow too inadequate a goal for a race of humans that had risen painfully from primeval slime and up the long ages to reason, why, the brain was a curse, an ominous threat to mankind. Of course, he mused, it had introduced many new and sensible changes in human life. Education, for instance, was no longer a haphazard process under the control of impatient parents. Children were now placed in special cities of their own, and brought up under the most careful of regimes. Yet here, too, the brain had inflicted its will-destroying philosophy upon the new generations. The reverence with which young people regarded that piece of machinery, Winters thought to himself bitterly, amounted to worship. What hope for the initiative and inventiveness of the race could there be under such a religion? And what was there left in the world for a man to do? The world was run upon electric power produced by waterfalls, as in this particular city, or by volcanic heat or by solar energy. Where portable power plants were required, automatic motors ran on atomic power. Nearly all machinery was automatic. The synthetic food laboratories, the cloth looms using synthetic fibre, the uncanny metal-working machine shops. Why, the brain didn't really need human beings at all. Could it be that people existed only upon its sufferance? 
When it had evolved sufficient automatic devices to care for its own needs, would it destroy these servants of flesh and blood, and live its own cold metallic life in solitary grandeur, upon a lifeless world? Winters shuddered at the prospect. Yet for the life of him, he could not find a flaw in his reasoning. His own work at the control board, how puerile, what purpose could it serve that couldn't be better handled by a machine? It did only one thing, it kept mankind occupied, and allayed any suspicions of the final, inevitable doom. As he stood there, fuming, a soft hand covered his eyes, and a low, feminine giggle sounded behind him. He wheeled about to gaze in dismay on the lady he'd last seen in the passage, and once again he forgot his dignity in startled fright. The light of the huntress in her eyes started his feet going before his wits could catch up with them. He took one of the automatic elevators to his floor, the twelfth, and felt rather foolish, but quite safe once more. He proceeded to order a meal and turned on the travelogue to make a journey by proxy in the broadcaster's airship. Chapter 3 The Revolt It was two days before he ventured down to the public rooms once more. This time he chose another passage, the Five Drink Zone, as it happened. He soon came upon a sunken room, floored in cushioned silk, where seven nude women danced silently in a rosy glow of perfumed mist, while several dozen people lay prone along the walls, looking on. He stood a moment, enthralled by the beauty of the scene, and when he turned to make his exit, there stood his pretty nemesis. He tried to brush past, but she linked an arm to his and brought her face close to his ear. He could not believe that these were the words he heard. The man in crimson said you would be grateful when he saved your life. Winters stood still, utterly dumbfounded. At least pretend you don't feel disgust at the mere sight of me. It so happens that I've seen more desirable males than you myself, you know. Come over here and lie down beside me and pretend to be interested. He started to speak, but she made a warning gesture, and he lay down quietly on the soft cushions. Presently the swirling mist enveloped them. I have been trying to reach you for three days. I couldn't go to your room because the brain has eyes everywhere. Here, if we whisper and pretend to be... to have other interests, we are fairly safe. What do you want? The time has come to redeem your promise to the man who saved your life. Well, if it has anything to do with freeing the world from the brain, I'll not refuse. Good man, I'm glad you feel that way. You are the only man in the world who can help us. I? What can I do that you can't? You have lived less than two weeks under the brain, therefore you can enter the temple itself. We cannot do that. But why not? I don't know exactly. After you have lived in the city of the brain for a month or so, something happens to your willpower. If you stand within a hundred feet of the temple, you lose all desire or intention, and must be led away again until you recover. The longer you live here, the farther you must stay from the brain. But right now you could lay your hands on the very metal that forms it. Winters pondered this amazing information a moment. B but how about the mechanics who work in the temple? They must wear metal helmets with a screen of magnetic force. And even so, the leader of this revolt wears the crimson, doesn't he? You don't understand. The helmets are issued only for definite jobs, and always three at a time. At the entrance to the temple, three men in helmets meet and enter. They don't know each other, for the helmet disguises them. One only carry tools. The other two carry weapons, which are kept aimed at the worker the entire time he's in the temple of the brain. At the least suspicious motion, you see? Yes, of course. The brain is cautious, it seems. Why? There have been other revolutions. One five hundred years ago was the last. Half the world was wiped out and the brain won, but this time he will lose. What is to be done? It's very simple, really, as far as you're concerned. There's a little passage into the temple off the corridor of the first zone here. It's unguarded because the second door that leads into the actual machinery of the brain is kept locked, and because no person can come very close anyway. But you can, Wilding. Between the two doors is a small courtyard. Down, along one corner, runs a cable sheathed in lead. You will take a knife with you to cut the lead and a small, flat transformer. Your job will be to attach the lead-ins of the transformer and then sever the cable. It is very simple, thanks to five years of hard work and planning by the man in crimson. But what good will that do? The brain runs on electricity. Now it's getting direct current 
you will change it to alternating current. The whole association of ideas, that's the very basis of reason, will be shattered and distorted. The brain will immediately go insane. Great God, but won't the brain see me at work? No, the courtyard leads nowhere and the light is poor. There is no detector installed there. Shh, quick, stroke my cheek, as if you were making love. The rosy mist lifted slightly and some of the couples were sauntering past, while the dancers had vanished. Presently the girl rose to her feet, and Winters went with her down the corridor, his mind in a swirl of excitement. She led him out of the zone, and up the first corridor to the room of the dusky red flame, where she held out her arms, and they swayed in a close dance, her mouth close to his left ear. "'We mustn't remain together for much longer,' she whispered. "'I'll take you to the hall, at the end of this corridor, and a man will speak to me. Remember that man.' He has concealed the transformer in his clothes. You will return to your own room, and on the way someone will give you both the transformer and a cutting tool. Keep these always concealed, for every wall has eyes in this city. Act as if someone were always watching you. You'll be right. And where shall I get this plan of the courtyard? I will dance it on the floor of this hall. You go forward, thus, to a glass ornament in the great room, and step to one side. So... Then slide behind it, and you find a small door. Open. Then turn to the right and go seven steps. If you place your hand at the level of your chest, you will find two loose bricks in the wall. Behind these lies the cable. The transformer is specially built to slip in the cavity so that the bricks can be replaced. Then, when the brain mechanics rush in to search for the cause of the trouble, they will not see anything until it's too late. In a few minutes, they proceeded along the corridor. The girl, whose name Winters learned was Clethra, made vivacious small talk and ogled him playfully, and came down to the great reception hall. Almost as they entered, a tall, dark man sauntered up to Clethra. Stoivlin has been looking for you everywhere, Clethra, he said severely. Winters thought his voice unnecessarily loud. You had better go and find him at once, and I not say anything about this wilding to him, if I were you. The girl's eyes widened in fright, though Winters had the feeling she was acting for someone's benefit. She left the two men together. His companion eyed Winters with a dry smile. You're playing with fire, I'm afraid. You'd do well to keep out of sight for the next few days. Bother. There, I've turned my ankle. Help me over to that couch, will you? Winters was suspicious and bewildered, but he put an arm under the other's shoulder and felt an object thrust into the fastening of his trousers at the waist. All was hidden by the concealing rope. You are suspected, came a startling whisper. You must go through with the plan in the next sixty seconds. Then, aloud, Thanks, it's really nothing. You'd better get out of sight before Clathra's lover arrives, Wilding. It might be well not to go back by the corridor, either. There's a small exit in that corner, behind the glasswork. Winters looked about him and thought he noticed an unusual number of red and green figures around the archway and in the corridor beyond. Several of the supervisors were looking in his direction, now or never. With assumed carelessness, he sauntered away in the direction of the indicated corner, and as he plunged into the maze of people and furniture in that part of the hall, he noticed, out of the corner of his eye, several figures start forward from the doorway. His heart was beating like a trip hammer as he came to the enormous glass ornament that filled the corner. He found room to squeeze behind it, and once out of sight, worked with feverish haste. The door opened readily, and he raced across a small courtyard to the corner at the right. The bricks came away readily, and he slit the lead covering of the cable with his knife. The transformer was unrecognisable as such to his eyes. It was a flat slab of spun wires, enormously complex in appearance. The lead-in wires were easily identified by Winters, and a clamp on each was quickly fastened to the cable. Then Winters had nothing to do but sever the cable with the cutting tool that had been tied to the transformer. But his curiosity that uppermost weakness of man, almost proves his undoing. In the centre of the second door, a small circular glass peephole was set. He must see the brain in action. Heedless of possible watching eyes, he stepped cautiously over and peered within. Before him towered that miracle of the age, the mechanical brain. In his excited state, it took a mere fraction of a second to impress the sight upon his mind. A hundred feet into the air rose the mass of wires and supporting girders, all lined with minute coils and banks of tiny wheels. It was a maze of intricacy from the floor up to the glass dome that formed the roof and extended out of sight on both sides. Grilled iron walks and ladders led in all directions, 
so that the mechanics could reach every part. Suddenly, some sixth sense warned him that he'd better complete his work. Back he raced to the cable, and clamped the cutting tool hard over it. Then he pulled, and suddenly it struck him like a dull blow on the back of his neck. A great, overpowering wave of indecision. He stood looking at the cutting tool as it rested on the half-severed wire. Something inside him said, Go ahead, pull on it. But there seemed to be no connection between the inner voice and his muscles. His arm was tiring of its position, and helpless he saw the tool slip slowly away. Then, as if by a miracle, he suddenly regained all his mental powers. What had happened? The last half-turn necessary to sever the wire had been supplied by his slipping hand. The brain was disconnected, dead. For a second he pondered leaving it that way and escaping, but he realised quickly that the fault would soon be found and mended. It was not such a simple matter for a man to outwit this giant thinking machine. He quickly removed the tool and replaced the loose bricks back tightly in place. He heard a sizzling in the transformer for a second, and then a great wave of fear shot through him as his brain reeled. Some nameless dread hovered in the back of his mind and seemed to darken the very light in front of his eyes. His throat was dry and his limbs trembled. With a stifled cry, he rushed from the courtyard and shut the door behind him, trembling. Then he felt better, as if he had shut horror behind him. He traversed the tiny passage and slipped from behind the glass ornament, entering the great glittering room full of people. No one seemed to be looking for him, though his heart pounded guiltily. He sauntered with elaborate nonchalance toward the archway that led to the corridor, and braced himself to show no emotion, for a dozen supervisors clustered there. He passed between them with the blood throbbing in his ears, and for one wild second he imagined that he might escape. Then a hand fell on his shoulder. Winters, you are wanted in audience by the brain. In sudden panic he fought to free himself and raced down the hall, managing a dozen strides before his pursuers caught up with him. Unceremoniously he was bundled into a room off the corridor, and a man in crimson stood in front of him, accusingly. Search him. Rough hands tore at his clothes, and the cutting tool was produced. The crimson man nodded grimly. He turned and pressed a button on the wall, and spoke into a small hole that opened at his touch. An attempt to tamper with your person, sire. The group waited stolidly for the sentence they knew would be pronounced. To their amazed ears, a metallic voice vibrated in the wall, these words, running water, poor running, running water, water and badly, badly studious conundrums. conundrums. The man in crimson started back in surprise, and a line of worry appeared between his eyes. The voice continued, Not, not departed airship megalomania. Then a silence. With red and swollen neck, the brain mechanic turned on Winters wrathfully. What is going on here? What has happened? Twist his arms, you there. Make him tell what he... But he never finished. A great booming roar set the floor trembling, and as they turned toward the door wonderingly, a man burst into the room, shouting, Three airships exploded over the city roof. They've wrecked the temple top itself. With a cry, the mechanic rushed away, the supervisors after him and Winters made his way unmolested out of the room, down the corridor, and into the street beyond. The city was in bedlam. Groups of men and women stood talking excitedly in the streets, or raced with pale, set faces along the moving platforms on some secret purposes. Here and there, crimson-robed mechanics pushed determinedly through the crowds in the direction of the temple, and overall rested a nameless horror of insanity that permeated the entire city. A dread shadow of fear hung over everything, Men did strange things, and thought strange thoughts. Winters looked on, wondering when the next step in the revolution would come and what form it would take. Presently he perceived resolute bands of men making their way to several vantage points. Near him one such band stopped, and its leader addressed the citizens. Her voice shrilled out, firm and persuasive, The brain is insane! Shall we permit it to drive us all out of our senses? Can you not feel its mental forces wrestling with you? In another hour or two, may we not commence killing each other, going violently mad? There was a movement of interest, and a shudder of fear went through the assembly. The brain must be silenced until it can be repaired. Only by doing so can we preserve our senses. But the men in crimson will not silence it, brothers. They have their protecting helmets. Why should they care? And we cannot bear this another hour. 
Some of us can't support another minute. See, seize that man quickly. He's out of control. Whether the incident was planned by the plotters, Winters could not tell. A huge red-faced man had commenced beating his head against the stone wall of the building. When several hands stretched out to seize him, he turned upon his would-be helpers and attacked them with breathtaking fury. Ten men jumped upon him, whereupon he subsided. The crowd was now thoroughly aroused, milling about and shouting, How much longer, brothers? Shall we wait quietly here until we go as that man went? A great shout of no rang out. Then if you want to save yourselves, there is only one way. Seize any weapons you can find and follow me. We will silence the brain. Away in a surging mob they swept, leaving the street bare. Winters followed some distance behind and saw them storm the great archway to the temple. It was a pitiful sight, for a solid group of crimson-robed mechanics stood there and mowed them down with some kind of firearm as fast as they came up. A great pile of dead and dying was heaped yards high like a barrier. But even as he looked, someone threw the first bomb. Its staccato explosion tossed fragments of limbs high into the air, and some white smoke shrouded the arch for a minute. When the smoke cleared, Winters saw a great river of humanity pouring through into the temple. The brain was doomed. Of that last desperate defence of the brain, he learned a few details afterwards. But no participant could remember very much. One by one, the last of the crimson-robed figures were hunted down and a thousand improvised hammers beat and pounded among the delicate apparatus. When order was restored by organised patrols, under the direction of the black-robed educators, the entire brain temple was a hopeless wreck, with metal and glass mingling with the red of human blood and the white of torn flesh. The entire air establishment of the world had vanished, for the brain, in its final insanity, had exploded every last airship, and with each there died its pilot, the supervisors were either killed or forced to remove their distinguishing colours, and many a one Winters saw making his way through the streets and passages clad only in torn underwear. By nightfall, the revolution was an accomplished fact, and in the Pleasure Palace's orgies were enacted beyond anything Winters had deemed human. He retired to his room in some disgust, but over and above this he experienced a sense of great accomplishment. He lay on his bed reflecting upon the day's work. Now, Surely, the human race would be tired of false starts, and be off along its path of progress. It would be a long path, of course, and his historian's soul sighed that he might be permitted to see the end, the result. But after all, why should he not? Perhaps if he found the man in crimson and obtained his help in building a new sleeping chamber. But these matters were taken out of his hands. When he awoke in the morning, he was famous from one end of the world to the other. He was Norman Winters the man who'd set the brain mad and freed the world from its dominance. Stoivlin, the man in crimson, and Clethra, who was his wife, as far as these people had permanent marriages, came into his room and aroused him. With these two, he was presented to the assembled council of educators. These proved to be kindly and intelligent men, most of them elderly. Winters was offered any reward he might name that lay within their powers. He replied that he had a certain scientific experiment he was intent upon, and asked whether he might have the assistance of Stoivlin and Clethra and such material as he needed. But have you no wish for position or rank? None, sir. So it was arranged presently that the three of them set forth in an airship, a very large one, loaded with many tons of lead and a store of equipment. It required much reiteration on the part of Winters to convince his companions of the truth of his story. What finally convinced them was the sight, through a fluoroscope screen, of Winter's anatomy. There was revealed unmistakably an organ no longer present in the bodies of modern human beings, an appendix. Winter's told them of his former awakening 5,000 years before, in the age of tree crops, of how he'd been sentenced to death as a representative of what they then called the Age of Waste, the 20th century. He wished his entire story kept absolutely secret, although both Stoivland and Clethra assured him that, now that the world had succeeded in perfecting atomic power and synthetic food, such economic questions had long been forgotten. Together the three commenced digging the tunnel with an amazingly adaptable digging machine, scarcely five feet high, which scooped out the dirt and sent it flying under the terrific impulse of its tiny atomic motor. When the work had proceeded some distance, they erected a tent over the mouth of the hole and returned to the city, 
to bring back four skilled mechanics, blindfolded. Not until they were inside the tent were the bandages removed from their eyes, and willingly enough they continued the construction at a rapid pace. In a week all was finished to the last detail, and the men were again blindfolded and led out into the airship and back to the city. In the meantime, Winters had prepared a strange book. The leaves were of sheet gold hinged at the back. It contained 200 pages and was very heavy, but it had the advantage of great permanence. On this he wrote with hydrochloric acid, using a glass stylus for a pen. 1950 AD, a world based on private advantage and dependent upon non-synthetic foods entirely. Human nature still savage, but mentality very advanced. 3000 AD, approximate date of the great revolution which overthrew tribal government and private hoarding. From here dates the human race as a single unit, speaking one language, and with its chief aim the reduction of work hours required to maintain the people in comfort. From here dates a change from using plants and grains for food to the use of tree fruits and crops. 5000 AD, date of winter's first awakening. He found a civilization whose chief political credo was economy and went on to observe future ages. 6500 AD, date of the first practical use of synthetic food. The country becomes deserted and cities multiply. Cities are no longer dependent on the country district for supplies. 7000 AD, an era of enormous prosperity and scientific advance. 7100 AD, Mars and Venus explored, mapped and several interesting forms of life brought back. No new or important minerals except radium on Venus in vast quantities, but so scattered as to be difficult to mine. 8200 AD, the mechanical brain now developed enormously and used to judge law cases and answer difficult questions. 8500 AD, the Council of Educators in control of the world and guided by the decisions of the brain. 9000 AD, a revolt by the educators to regain the power which the brain had gradually taken over from them. The brain and its defenders were prepared with deadly scientific weapons, and the revolt was suppressed with great loss of life. 9500 AD, the last of several uprisings against the brain, suppressed with great loss of life, and many people escape into the wilderness. From now on the course of history is stable. The brain is constantly strengthening its position in the world and seeking to bring the last human being in from the wilderness to avoid any possible uprising from without. 10,000 AD The destruction of the brain and the recommencement of the human race's efforts to improve its own mentality and physique. This is the date of Winter's second awakening. Finally, the day came that Winter's had set for his departure, or his burial, as Clethra sadly termed it, he made a last inspection of his chamber. It was fifty feet below the surface of the ground, and was lined with six feet of lead as before. His clock was run by radium, and a checking clock was set up by the temperature difference between winter and summer. A great battery of X-ray and violet ray lamps lined the ceiling, and were to be operated by an atomic motor, which ran continuously, and would so run upon the power furnished by a pound of powdered calcium for five thousand years. Above his couch, a glass container was filled with a specially prepared liquid, food and tonic. A synthetic rubber, imperishable tube, led from this down to the couch and would, when he went to sleep, be fastened to a mask over his mouth. Upon waking, he would merely have to swallow, for the clock would automatically start the liquid running at the proper time, a few hours after the lights had been flashed on. Winters examined everything and looked forward to his next awakening with impatience. He was getting on in years, and this way of life could not continue indefinitely. It therefore behoved him to waste none of his still remaining lifespan. Nevertheless, it was with real regret that he said his farewells. The tent had long since been removed, and the hole cunningly hidden by growing shrubs. The airship that was to take his companions back to the city stood close by, ready for the flight. A good voyage to you, said Stoivlin, or should I perhaps say sweet dreams? Goodbye, and you too, Clethra. You're surely not sorry to see the last of me. I am most certainly sorry. Why not? Don't you remember how hard you tried to avoid me in the beginning? How foolish I was. There, you are forgiven. 
but I must kiss you once just to prove that no man can escape when a woman has decided to pursue him. He watched the airship rise into the sky, now darkening with the purple glow of sunset, and set off eastward into the approaching nightfall. He stood a half hour gazing after it, thinking sadly of his lonely future. When he awoke, these people would be dead, and the city they lived in perhaps a forgotten ruin. Might he not after all be happier to remain here? Then his thoughts went back still further, to his own age eight thousand years before. Had he realised how irrevocable a thing time was, would he ever have started on this odyssey through the millennia? Once gone, time was forever gone, a memory, a nothing. He could not go back. There was nothing left but to go forward, friendless and forlorn though he might be. Somewhere, he thought, with a sudden surge of hope, somewhere in the dim future must lie an answer to the enigma of life. He would find in it his reward. But whether or no, what was past could never be brought back. He thought of the lines of the Persian poet. The moving finger writes, and, having writ, moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. And now the light went out of the sky, and the stars appeared. Old familiar friends, though even they had been altered slightly by the inexorable march of the equinoxes. The moon was rising early that night, and, silhouetted against its glory, the dark figure of Winters could be observed as he squeezed among the concealing shrubs. He vanished from sight, and the sound of the capstone being moved in place was audible at a few feet distance. Then the moon rose, stately and cold, and shone down upon that empty wilderness as she had shone for centuries, and as she would continue to shine for yet untold eons of time.